My name is Paul Hughes. I'm the director of the Birmingham Prayer Furnace, and with me is James Pinto, Jim Pinto, who is the director of the Father James Coyle Memorial Project. And together, we are wanting you to be aware of something coming up this spring here in Birmingham that involves the Methodist, the United Methodist Church, uh, Bishop Will Willimon, and the Roman Catholic Bishop of this diocese, Bishop Baker. And uh, we long to see something happen this year that will bring an event back into the consciousness of our city that many are unaware of that 90 years ago, in 1921, on the 50th anniversary of Birmingham as a city, a very terrible event occurred. It was a national crime where a Methodist preacher assassinated the Father James Coyle of the St. Paul Cathedral Church in downtown Birmingham. That man was exonerated. He was declared not guilty by a court uh, here in Birmingham about a month after the murder he confessed to. And so this injustice was brought to the attention of Bishop Will Willimon of the United Methodist Church, and he was stirred. He was ready for Jim as the leader of the Father James Cole Memorial Project to meet with him and to propose to bring together the Roman Catholic Bishop with the Methodist Bishop in a Lenten reconciliation event. So we're here to talk about that and would you help our people understand what is the significance of something that happened 90 years ago in Birmingham, Alabama? Why is it important today? Well, I think of that scripture verse that speaks about uh, the, the blood of the innocent crying out. Now, I don't know if that continues to happen in terms of Father James E. Coyle, but if there could be any doubt about that, why not lay that to rest? He was an incredibly uh, holy man of God, Father James E. Coyle, who ministered through 19, 1904 through 1921. Father Coyle had a heart for all God's children, whether they were Protestant or Catholic or non-believers. Uh, he was the kind of man that welcomed everyone into uh, his congregation there at St. Paul's. Uh, he had people from the Middle East that didn't have any place to worship who were Christians. They could come to St. Paul's. He was involved in the starting of the first uh, black Catholic uh, parish. It was developed later as, as, a, as a school. Um, Father Coyle was an incredible man who would walk the streets of Birmingham and would share with everyone. Uh, he would say his prayers each night out on the parsonage porch. And there were a lot of people that didn't understand Catholics at that time, around 1904, maybe even earlier. And really, there were quite good relationships between Catholics and Protestants in Birmingham uh, early on in the late 1800s and until about 1917. And then this real strong uh, anti-Catholic bigotry began to manifest itself. And I think it was connected with some things that went on down in Florida with the winning of a, an election there. And what they learned in Florida was if you become anti-Catholic, you can really mobilize a vote. And so this began to stir up in Birmingham. And Father Coyle was uh, the most eloquent spokesperson for, for the faith, the Catholic faith, in this region. And uh, he was one that would uh, be willing to, to reason and share with people or even argue and debate in a good spirit through the newspapers because a lot of people didn't understand what Catholicism was about. So they would raise issues that were legitimate issues. He would address these theological issues, but it changed in 1970. And the issues became then uh, more like you're stockpiling weapons. The Catholic Church wants to uh, take over the country. Uh, Catholics are kidnapping young girls and holding them hostage, all these strange things. And Father Coyle was you know, speaking and saying, you know, against these things and, and clarifying these things, he just kind of, kind of heated up. He became a target for assassination for about two years. So when he was finally assassinated in 1921, uh, the threats on his life were pretty clear for two years. We have the FBI records on this and the concern that they had with his life. So Father Coyle was going to welcome everyone. And in, in 1921, there was a, a, a marriage that uh, 
he oversaw that took place between a dark-skinned Puerto Rican, a Catholic man, and a convert girl from Methodism uh, named Ruth. She had spoken with Father Paul when she was a young girl years before this wedding and learned about Catholicism, and it really moved her. And she said she couldn't live without being Catholic, and that was the way she saw it. And when she went back to her father, uh, Stevenson, this Methodist uh, uh, preacher, um, who was also, in all indications, was a Klansman, uh, said that if you go back there, we will place a bomb under Father Cornell's parsonage and kill him. This was years before. The years went on. She may have been about 12 years old when this took place. She turned 18 years old. She wanted to marry this man. Uh, and so Father Coral got the call to do this wedding. And he did it at St. Paul's Church. And as he was doing the wedding, his, his uh, sister, who came to care for him from Ireland, he was an Irish missionary priest, uh, she was a witness to the wedding, and there was another priest, I believe, who was witnessing the wedding. Father Coyle said to them, when I do this wedding, stand back. Don't move back. I just want to do the wedding this way. I don't want you right there. He was concerned, we have documentation, that he, he had said the night before, I'm going to be doing the wedding of Edwin Stevenson's daughter. He's probably going to kill him. Well, he did this wedding anyway, and uh, said to her, Make sure you tell your father, you know, immediately what's taking place here and so on. And then he did what he normally did. He went out and said his prayers on the parsonage porch, sitting there. And then uh, Reverend Stevenson came up and came in through the gate and at point blank range, fired three times at Father Coyle, one of the bullets hitting him in his temple, out the back of his skull. And it hit the church building. And Father Coyle was killed in cold blood. Reverend Stevenson, uh, with gun in hand, went right over to the courthouse right next door. He was known as the marrying parson. That's what he did full time was marrying people. So it's quite ironic that he winds up assassinating someone that performs a legitimate wedding uh, between people who are adults who've decided to be married, and he assassinates this one that does this. And he goes into the courthouse. I think he went in through a window, which went right in, it was right next door to St. Paul's, and he said, I just killed the priest, the smoking gun in his hand. Anyway, Father Coyle was taken up to St. Vincent's Hospital where he later died, not, not long thereafter. But uh, I think it was a five-day trial or so. Uh, came out of this, Hugo Black was his defense attorney, very famous attorney, very fine attorney. Uh, later on, we know that Hugo Black was identified as a Klansman. We believe the judge was a Klansman. Uh, many of those that heard the case there uh, were Klansmen. And uh, uh, Edwin Stevenson was released for temporary insanity and given his gun back. And he continued his ministry and did whatever. The Catholic Church, of course, was, the, was just decimated in many ways. Was very, very much grieving. This wonderful, young, passionate priest who loved all people being assassinated. It was an open casket. They wanted people to see his face. They wanted to see where he was shot. And many, many people came to this. It was the largest uh, funeral in the history of Birmingham, not the state of Alabama. Well, I want to say that many clergy did come out to denounce this act, and that was very good. It really brought a lot of people together, um, and they did denounce it. Uh, but Father Coyle was then then buried, and uh, there really was not much more much more said about this tremendous injustice, um, and uh, not much all that much talk about Father Coyle until these recent times. He's been a great you know, help in that. Uh, but I think it would be a beautiful thing. It would be a beautiful thing to come together maybe the season of Lent at one of the Lenten services, probably in the Methodist Church. And as part of that season of Lent, where we are in that special focus for repentance, dealing with our own sinfulness. If there's anything unsettled here in the city of Birmingham regarding the shedding of the innocent blood of this man, well, let's have a prayer about that. Let's lay that to rest more fully. Let's Methodists and Catholics and all sorts of people come to you. Let's not be afraid that we're going to stir up again this whole thing about it. And it's not even so much, we understand that he did not represent the whole Methodist church, but that he was from that body. Um, and we're not here to stir up, you know, Protestant and Catholic and Anabas. We're here to talk about unity. Yes. That we stand together, that we believe every life is sacred, and that we want to say that again. And that there is a, a good, healthy, tolerance, that we can argue, we can debate, we can be 
violence against one another. So I think coming forth like that, saying that this was a great and just stuff, the legal community comes as well. I invite people from the legal community. This was a, an amazing injustice for the legal system. It's a travesty of justice. I hope that there'll be legal representatives as well as religious representatives. Maybe even people from the city. She should invite the mayor. I, I hope the mayor will come. I hope people in the city will come. That we would lay this whole thing to rest so this was amazingly evil that such a person like this would be assassinated in cold blood. And so I think it's a great opportunity. I think it'll be a great healing time. I think it'll be a time that'll bond the whole body of Christ more fully together and uh, will be a great teaching moment for our city. There's actually a book that has been recently written uh, by a law professor at a Midwest University called Rising Road. And uh, as a legal case, this is fascinating, even today, because it involved issues of race, of religion, uh, romance. And uh, because this happened in a corporate way, I believe that God desires corporate sin and injustice to be repented of corporately, no matter how long it takes, no matter how many generations pass. And so this opportunity lies ahead of us. And I believe uh, when this happened, Birmingham had just turned 50. The president, Warren G. Harding, came to Birmingham that year and spoke really a challenging word to the city on the issues of Catholic bigotry and racial bigotry. And I wonder, we're coming up, Jim, on the jubilee of the 16th Street bombing in 1963, where four girls were killed by the Klan many decades after this event. And our mayor, Mayor Bell, and other southern cities uh, are proposing during the Jubilee uh, coming up of another opportunity to see uh, how we have repented and how we're moving forward with honor. But these marking these particular events of citywide corporate participation because we may not be the one to pull the trigger or plant the bomb but we all share a responsibility if we don't fully own our role and take responsibility for a city that God desires for his own glory. So for more information about this upcoming Linton event, uh, we will point you to a site that uh, is... It's a fathercoil.org, fathercoil.org, just like that. We'll take you to the website where you can call 205-447-8796. That's 205-447-8796. And we hope to see you there.